All right, open your Bibles to with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I want us to look at the Beatitudes that Jesus said, which I think are so relevant, based upon the events that we have seen take place this week. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit means the person who understands his spiritual bankruptcy. You see, most people, even religious people, lie to themselves about who they are. They think themselves righteous without Jesus Christ. They refuse to acknowledge to themselves that they are sinners, that they have violated the laws of God, that their soul is unrighteous, deserving the wrath of heaven. They are proud. They are full of arrogancy. They believe that they are righteous in and of themselves, that they do not need God, they do not need salvation and redemption, they do not need the death of Christ for the cleansing of sin. They're filled with inner pride and arrogance. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit is the individual who understands their own spiritual impoverishment. They're honest with themselves. They know that before a holy, righteous God, their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They know they've sinned. They know they've come short. They know that when compared to the standard of God, they have fallen short. They're not kidding themselves about who they are. Too many people in church today are filled with religious pride and arrogance. And as such, are disqualified for the blessing of heaven. You can, never, you can never receive the blessing of heaven until you take the first step to be honest with yourself and recognize you don't deserve the blessing of heaven. As long as you are filled with self-righteousness, you will never ever experience the righteousness of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They know they're, they're impoverished spiritually. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. By mourning, it, it falls on the heels of the first beatitude. Not only are they conscious of their bankruptcy spiritually before God, but they seek redemption. They mourn over their sin. They are not only honest enough to recognize it, but they are contrite enough in their hearts to know that they need forgiveness for it. Again, the proud, arrogant soul thinks he needs forgiveness for nothing. In his heart, he is as vile and as wicked as any other man. He may not have done what somebody else has done, but in his heart, he's just as wicked 
His thoughts are just as vile. His heart is just as sinful as any other man. So the proud not only doesn't recognize his bankruptcy before God, but he, he refuses to be contrite and repentant of that sin before heaven. Blessed are they that mourn. They, they, uh, they have godly sorrow for their sin. They have godly remorse for their sin. They feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in righteousness, shining the spotlight of truth and of righteousness on their sin-sick soul. And they know that they are a sinner before God. And they are sorry for the offense they have made against heaven. They are sorry for what they have done against their creator. They mourn over their sin. There is a contriteness over their sin. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The salvation and the redemption that God gives to us through faith in Jesus Christ gives us peace and comfort and joy and the love of God that passes all understanding. And dear friend, if you've never come to that point of honesty with yourself, quit playing games with yourself. Admit you're a sinner before God. Admit your sin has separated you from God. Admit that Jesus loved you enough to go to the cross and die for you. And that when you come to him by faith, in a spirit of repentance, he will save you, he will forgive you, he will cleanse you, he will redeem you, and give you all of the joy and the peace of your heart that you could possibly ever want in this life. <laughs> Blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. The meek means put it in a vernacular it, it it means gentlemanly it means not thinking of oneself above others greek word means level in other words not thinking yourself better or superior to other people When meekness fills a person's heart, there can be no bigotry. There can be no prejudice. There can be no feeling of superiority over another individual or another group of individuals. Prejudice and bigotry are founded in arrogance and pride. It's the same ones that, that do not mourn for their sin. It's the same ones that do not acknowledge their sin. They are filled with all kinds of bigotry and prejudice against others. They prove by their prejudice that they have not the spirit of meekness in them. Who do they think they are? That they are better than somebody else. Who do they think they are that their race is better than another race? Or that their ethnicity is superior to another ethnicity? We have to be very careful as Americans that we do not fall victim of a false pride and arrogance because of the country in which we were born or in which we live. I remind you, John 3.16, God so loved the world, not just the United States, he loves the world. A soul in China a soul in North Korea, a soul in Saudi Arabia, a soul in Russia 
is just as precious to God as a soul in the United States of America. And the same natural laws of God given us by our Creator apply to each of us equally. There's all kinds of snobbery present in this world today based upon feelings of false superiority. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Blessed are people who are honest and humble enough to recognize that under God we are all equal before the Lord. God is no respecter of persons. America has thought itself superior in many ways for many years. We are the exceptional nation, meaning we are above accountability. We are above the natural laws of God relative to the laws of nation, relative to the laws of war. We can do whatever we want because we have the biggest stick. We have the most powerful army, the most powerful military, therefore we have no accountability. If we do it, then it must be right because after all we are the mightiest country and might makes right. That is the attitude of many in Washington, D.C. That's the attitude of many at the U.S. Pentagon. That's the attitude of many in the U.S. State Department. That's the attitude of many in the CIA. That's the attitude of many Christians in the, in the pews. And ma many of the people whose blood is being shed at the hands of uncontrolled and undisciplined and unlawful people in government in this country are our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We don't think about the people that are being blown apart, the blood that's shed, the families that are destroyed and we don't think about these people we just think about them as well they're enemies well who said they're enemy well the president said they're an enemy or the secretary of defense said they're an enemy so they're an enemy and many of these people that we are slaughtering by the tens of thousands are our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we're going to spend eternity in heaven with these people. How in the world are we going to face them at the day of judgment? They don't understand why Christian, quote unquote, America is bombing them with drones and missiles and, and jets. Why are their families being destroyed? Why are their homes being destroyed? Why are, they, why are they being killed? They worship the same Lord we worship. They are, they are our brothers in Christ. And we are murdering them by the thousands in this relentless pursuit of establishing a global new world order for the international bankers who don't even believe in God, much less respect His laws. Right. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which hunger 
and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They desire righteousness. Righteousness involves many things. It involves truth. It involves love. It involves the principles of peace. It involves the principles of law and right and decency. All the things that we should have been taught by our parents as we were growing up. The things that are inbred in us by our Creator at, at conception and then birth. The basic common laws of right of which if all men would adhere to, it would be a much more peaceful world. Much less Christians. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Boy, just remember... Remember, remember what God has on you. No, I don't know it. The person sitting next to you doesn't know it. But God knows it. He's got... He's got it all over you. Christians could be so judgmental and, and condemning, like vicious dogs attacking a wounded animal, just without mercy, without regard, without compassion trying to destroy. I don't understand it. I don't understand people that call themselves Christians that can act like wild animals when it comes to trying to destroy one another. But I've tasted it up close and personal. I've experienced it from people that I never dreamed, never dreamed in my farthest imagination would ever do and say against me what they did and said. Would never imagined it. And they do it without, without pity, without regard, without without a second thought, and then not only that, after they have tried to devour the, the innocent, they have the audacity to go to church next Sunday and hold their hands up to heaven and talk about how much they love Jesus, how spiritual they are, how holy they are. Some of the meanest, honoriest, most cantankerous, cruelest people on the planet are sitting in our churches every Sunday all over the country. The church itself is filled with these kind of people. Blessed are the merciful. We that have been forgiven by God, how can we act as prosecutors and, and condemn others with no regard to what God has forgiven us for?
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. The Pharisees of Jesus' day acted pure on the outside. They went through the liturgies. Oh, they went through the ceremonies. They acted so pious and so honorable and so spiritual. Their long prayers and their formalities. They presented themselves as pure. But God, the Lord Jesus, told them, you're like, a, you're like an open sepulcher on the inside. You are a rotting, filthy, stinking, dead corpse. Morally, spiritually, righteously, on the inside. Jesus saw them for what they were inside. We're limited in our perspective man looks on the outward appearance we don't see the heart all we can go by are the actions and the words and so forth but God is not limited he sees the heart and he knows whether it's a pure heart or not he knows whether it's a clean heart or not he knows whether it's a good heart or an evil heart you can smile and you can pretend and you can do all of that. You can fool everybody around you, but you cannot fool God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The people in whom the spirit of the Lord indwells, and even, can we say, people that have the basic understanding and recognition of the natural laws that God has given us in creation are always men and women of peace. A warlike spirit is not of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Where are the peacemakers in our churches today? How has it come? I, I've struggled with this for years. How has it happened that Christian people, they come to church, they bring their Bible, they sing the songs, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. And then they walk out the door and bomb them all, kill them all, wipe them off of the face of the earth. Go to war, 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 war. Kill, destroy. I have had pastors, I have had Christians by the dozens that have told me one on one and thinking themselves righteous when they say it. What we ought to do is just wipe Iraq off of the face of the earth. Well, I'll just wipe Syria off the face of the earth. Well, I'll just wipe North Korea off the face of the earth. Wow. How did these people become such war mongers? How did they become so bloodthirsty? Blessed are the peacemakers. War, killing, is only as a last resort, my friends. 
in an act of self-defense. In an act of self-defense, God has established the rightness of taking life in the cause of defending your own or others. That is a far cry from people who have it in their hearts, who want to go kill millions and millions of people who have never threatened them and pose no threat against them. How has it happened? I'm listening to these pastors that claim to be President Trump's advisors, spiritual advisors, going around the country justifying aggressive war. No declaration of war, no threat against us, no attack occurring going around promoting aggressive, preemptive war. I'll say it straight up, President Trump doesn't need any more spiritual advisors like these. What President Trump needs is one real prophet of God to tell him the truth about the Word of God. Just one! The president of my alma mater got up a few days ago and told the press that Donald Trump could be the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln. And I thought to myself, boy, if he only knew what he just said. Abraham Lee was the biggest tyrant in the history of the United States presidency. He was, he meant it as a compliment though. He, he just didn't know better. Last week we talked about Elisha the prophet and how God preserved and protected the nation of Israel, not through that godless king, but through that prophet. And how the prophet respected the laws of God, how he respected the lives of people, when he could have killed those that had come against Israel, he chose another way, and in doing so, he protected the nation of Israel. I'm telling you what America needs, and I guess I'm repeating myself from last week now, but what we need more than we need more aircraft carriers and more, and more armaments and more missiles and more ICBMs and more... Uh, what we need in America are more prophets of God to stand in the gap for the Lord and be that, that prophet of truth so that God's blessing can return on this country because right now it's not the hand of blessing on America, it's the hand of judgment on America and it's getting worse every day. Blessed are the peacemakers. And then verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus went on 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This is what Adam Clark writes about verse 11. When men shall revile you and persecute. Listen carefully. Remember, this is written in the 19th century. The persecution mentioned in the preceding verse comprehends all outward acts of violence, all that the hand can do. This comprehends all calumny, slander, etc. All that the tongue can affect. Persecute is a forensic term and signifies legal persecutions and public accusations, which, though totally unsubstantiated, were the means of destroying multitudes of the primitive or early Christians. And we're seeing this vile vicious act happening in front of our very eyes today. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my names, for my sake. And, and listen, whenever a person, I don't care if he's in politics or if he's in the pulpit or if he's in the, if he's in the, the workplace or if he's in business, or whatever his, his vocation might be, his calling. When a person stands up for truth, all truth is of God, remember. When he stands up for truth, God's truth, he's standing up for God. principles of God reflect the God who gave those principles. And when anybody stands on the right side of those principles, they are standing for, to use the words of the Lord, my sake. Just my sake. Because these are my truths. These are my principles. This is my word. You don't have to be in the pulpit to stand up for his truth. Wherever you are, when you do so, you are standing for him. And when you are persecuted because you have taken his side, you have positioned yourself under his banner. You have put yourself in alliance with his truth. And when you are persecuted for the position that you stand in, in the place you stand in, in the position you took, ultimately, persecutors are not persecuting you. They're persecuting the Lord God who created the truths upon which you stand. They're persecuting Christ. That's why Jesus said in the book of John chapter 15 and verse 20, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. This is really not about us. Ultimately, this is a battle between good and evil. Between right and wrong. Between God and Satan.
I am of the personal conviction that there are multitudes of people at various levels of responsibility, including government, that are truly obsessed or even maybe possessed of satanic forces. Here is something that you need to understand, and this is what the secularists do not see and cannot um, uh, comprehend, and I understand that they don't understand. It's fine. But those of us who know the Spirit of God and those of us who know spiritual reality have to be aware of this. The true battles that we fight are spiritual in nature. Paul said in Ephesians 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It is a spiritual battle. And all you and I can see is the physical, the exterior. That's why so many people get caught up with Republican and Democrat and left and right and conservative and liberal because they are they are so limited in their vision they cannot see beyond republican and democrat beyond liberal and conservative beyond left and right and that's okay for the secularists i guess and people that don't have a spiritual vision but those of us that are christians should know better we should understand that there is a spiritual battle taking place, which means there is a real God and a real Satan that are at war with one another in this world. And they, and they the devil, will organize and orchestrate his minions to do what he wants them to do to accomplish his purposes in his fight against God's truth. And we don't see that part of it. Believe you me, believe you this, the devil is not a Democrat or a Republican. He's got a bunch of them in both camps on his team. He is the, he is the ultimate conspirator. It's a spiritual war. And sometimes we get caught up in the, the political part of it. We get caught up in the physical part of it that we fail to recognize that there is a spiritual battle going on here that we're not, we're not seeing and that much of this activity is not so much political in nature, it's not so much physical in nature as it is spiritual in nature, and even many of the ones who are doing the work of the evil one are not even themselves aware that he is the one pulling the strings. They have all kinds of good intentions about what they're doing, and they don't even know that they're, that they're on the wrong team. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.9, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. In other words, I have been accused of doing evil, and they put me in prison. The Apostle Paul. I've been accused of doing evil and they put me in prison. But evil is not what men say it is. 
Evil is what God says it is. And righteousness is not what men say it is. Righteousness is what God says it is. There's a lot of people today that call evil good and good evil. But God knows the difference. And so should you and I. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 4 through 10. Let me read these verses to you. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, that would be scourging, whips, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness of the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, listen to this, by evil report and good report. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution if you haven't suffered persecution as a Christian there's only one reason for that you ain't doing nothing bad English good theology if you're doing something worthwhile taking a stand you will suffer the evil report the accusation the persecution you will you will suffer it that's why in 1st Timothy 519 the Apostle Paul said against an elder meaning pastor Receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Because the pastor is going to be accused of many, many things by many, many people. Revelation 12.10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, meaning Satan. The accuser of the brethren. I tell you the truth, I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of these accusers against those who are standing for righteousness for all of the money in the world. Whatever these accusers are getting paid to make their accusations against Judge Roy Moore, I promise you, it's not enough. It's not enough. Judas got his 30 pieces of silver too. And it didn't help him escape the judgment of God one whit. Neither will these accusers of righteous men and women today escape the judgment of God for their scurrilous, evil accusations that they make. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, it's talking about in the latter days, perilous times shall come, and it gives a big long list. Verse 3 says, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. Titus 2, 3. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. In Luke chapter 3, verse 14, John the Baptist is the person in view here, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? 
the soldiers speaking to John the Baptist. And he said unto them, do violence to no man. We've talked about that. The second thing he said to them, neither accuse any falsely. I have had to pray along with David many, many times in Psalm 3115. My times are in thy hand, speaking of God. My times are in thy hand. My work, my ministry is in the hands of God. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. If there is no other reason to believe in God, for any of you out there that might be foolishly toying with the supposition that there is no God, I can absolutely positively prove to you that there is a God. I can prove it. Are you ready? I'm still here. That is the only explanation for why I'm still here. You think I'm kidding some of you don't. Humanly speaking, I wouldn't be here without the providential, protective, guarding, loving hands of God. I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. He said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. I pray for you, Brother Roy Moore, dear precious friend. I pray for your family, your sainted 91-year-old mother whose heart must be torn as we cannot imagine. I pray for your children, your grandchildren, I pray for your protection. I pray that God will give you favor in the hearts and the minds of the good people of Alabama. And that on election day here in just a few weeks, you will be standing as the victor in what is, and everyone knows, a critical race for the future of our country. And I pray for all of the men and women across this country who may be lesser known, but just as courageously, just as faithfully standing without fear for the cause of God and truth and right and liberty pray that God will protect each of you and God will allow us to continue the fight
you will be persecuted. You will be falsely accused. Little caveat. You know what this does also, this kind of thing that's happening now in Alabama? There's a lot of good, honorable, God-fearing people across the country that are wanting to run for public office. And they know that they're not going to buckle to the establishment. That they're going to stand four square for truth and the Constitution, principles of the Bill of Rights, etc. That they're not going to be part of the good old boy system. And they see what's happening to judge more and they're second guessing whether or not they should subject themselves and their families to that kind. of gut-wrenching horror. Understandable. But that's what the enemy wants you to think. The enemy wants you to be afraid. The enemy wants you to stay out of the fray. The enemy wants to intimidate you by making an example out of somebody so as to put fear in your heart. I say to each of you in this room and those of you that are watching, no matter what position God has called you to fill, no matter what your vocation is, what your calling is, wherever you are standing and whatever you are doing, Yes, there will be persecution. Yes, there will be false accusation. Yes, the enemy will not lie down without a fight. But I submit to you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I encourage you with all of the conviction of my soul, do not retreat, do not stop. Do not fall short. Stand up and fulfill the place and the calling that God has given you. And together come victory or death. Let us be true to truth. Let's stand for a word of prayer.